Hi everyone and welcome to Playmakers. Over the next four or five weeks here in Australia, Justin Marshall and myself will be musing over what we're seeing with the All Blacks, uh, the general state of Australian rugby, etc, etc. Well, of course, uh, it's all done and dusted. Bledisloe Cup, number three, all over. And it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome former Wallaby Phil Kearns, who probably hasn't quite got over it. <laughs> no, I haven't. And welcome to my home. Sorry about the rain. I've just discovered a leak in my roof, which is dripping on Marshy, which is great, because he was like a Chinese <laughs> water torture back in those days. So I'm very glad it's dripping on him. It's good. Did we, um, talking about the rugby, of course, did we see this coming? Now Moonga flat to Barrett. Straight out sprint. Can he get there? Yes, he can. Well, I think with the age of the Wallaby side, we should have seen it coming. Well, I think we we're a little bit more hopeful after that first test. Um, and I thought they had a little more in them. I think we lost the experience of Tamua and, and uh, James O'Connor in particular were mm. big losses to us, probably bigger losses than, than we thought. And I think while, while some of those guys, not Noel Olesio, played good super rugby, um, when you hit a test arena, it's, it's a lot different. Yeah, I was kind of thinking when we were leading into that test match, you know, what sort of licence uh, Dave Rennie would give those two young players and whether or not they were going to have the ambition to play. Because that's when people were at their best, when they are able to express themselves. But you get under the pressure of win, trying to win a Bledisloe Cup for the first time in, what, 18 years, there's that expectation level on you. Are you going to be able to then just have a licence to go out and do what you do? And I thought they, tactically, they probably got a little bit wrong as well by putting him back at fullback a lot, and, and that's added pressure of having to take high balls. The All Blacks kicking game was really accurate. Probably just didn't help themselves in, in that regard either, and then game management wasn't great, but it doesn't help when you're dropping the ball. So, Yeah, the first three minutes we lose Dongunu, oh, yeah. um, ten minutes in the bin, and... You know, I think an O'Connor and a Tamil would have probably responded differently to what two guys playing their first test would have would have done, and it did fall apart a little bit right from right from the start. And that maturity showed. I agree with you. I don't know why. If you're a ten, you play ten. Whether it's attack or defence, you're playing ten. So yeah. if you can't do both, don't pick them. But um, so we've we've fallen into that trap quite a number of times over the last decade. I mean, we tried to hide Quade Cooper in defence years ago and we're still doing it. It didn't work back then and it's still not working now. Do you think that was a tactical thing where they were trying to um, replicate the All Blacks dual pivot? Because, but when I think about it, Haylett Petty doesn't really... No, he's not a He's not really a first or a first receiver. So why they wanted to have that dynamic of dropping a young player back, you know, a 20-year-old, and um, having to deal with... Like the likes of Caleb Clark coming at him off a high, high ball, it's like, nah, give that a miss. Yeah, and, and, and the decisions that you've got to make, so I'm told I never played a lot out there, but the wings and fullback. You used to hover around there all the time, mate. The, not as Jeez. much as Dane Coles. You but but used to have a cups of tea out in the wing. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to make really important decisions when you're wing and fullback. Like you've got a lot of field to cover, and you've got to make really good decisions about where you have to be. And for Noah to have not played... 15 before and have to make those decisions in a test against <laughs> New Zealand for the Bledisloe Cup, well. Did he have any other options, Rennie? I mean, once Tamua and O'Connor were gone, did he have any other options that he could have gone back on? Uh, well, there's only, to, uh, in terms of proper, and I'll, I'll use the word advisedly, but proper 10s, you've got Harrison and Lolosio uh, on the way up. They're both 20, 21 year olds. Mm -hmm. Um, but the other alternative is Rhys Hodge, who we saw came on in the last 10 minutes of the game. He's played 10 all his junior career. I um, mean, he's a big 10, a 6 foot 4, 10. You know, we'd like to see them. There's been lots of 10s that aren't as robust as what, uh, from, from both countries, <laughs> yeah. who aren't as robust as a 6 foot 4 Rhys Hodge. So maybe that was an option. But, you know, if you just lost to Moore, then yeah, there were other options you could take. But when you lose both of them, there wasn't much. When you saw the team come out, Kernsey, for that test match and it being so important, were you surprised at a few of the selections? Or you thought that they put the best team that they could put out there? Maybe that 10's debatable. But apart from that, like, like I really couldn't understand why Tupo wasn't playing. He's such a threat yeah. with the ball. He, he attracts attention. But, you know, they decided to, to go with Ala Alatoa as well. So were you happy with the team that he put out well, there? I, I, yeah, I, th I think uh, Tupo 
in hindsight, probably should have started. I think they were hoping that he'd be the, the, the yeah, the impact. Of, you know, it's close with, you know, close test with 20 minutes to go. You can bring someone like that can do something special. But I don't think he touched the ball, um, even in that last 20, the 25 that he was on. Um, they just didn't feed him the pill. Um, well, they didn't have it so, to start <laughs> with, which, which didn't help. Um, you know, I think most of the team was pretty good. Um, and I, I use that advisedly because this is a really, really young team. I, 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 you know, I can't stress how young. We were just talking about it, weren't we? You know, you've got five or six guys there that are 19, 20 years of age. Mm. And uh, the, the thing that I do like about them, uh, and I really like about them, is they're actually, it seems to me, a different feel within the squad. Um, that they're actually playing because they want to be in a wall of a jersey. They want to be representing their country in, in that gold jersey. They're not playing because their contract tells them they have to and they're not playing for money. Um, that's The motivations seem quite different. And I think the way they've been brought through that under-20s, under-18s, under-20s system um, has maybe fed a different attitude into them, which, which is what I do like. And, you know, I think back, to again, we, I hate to say it, but back in the early days of my career, and we had 89 90 when Bob Dwyer brought in Tony Daly and myself and Tim Horan and Jason Little and Willie Offerhan Galway, and you know, just this whole young group. We were probably a little luckier because we had Liner, Far Jones, Poitivan around us, Campisi around us, um, whereas these guys haven't don't really have that benefit once they lost O'Connor and Tamua. Um, they don't, didn't have that benefit. So um, there, there are some really good kids there. Harry Wilson, I think, is going to have a really long future. There's a young prop, Angus Bell, on the way through. Lola Seo, Harrison, and there's a few others. There's a really good 10 playing club rugby here uh, called Tane Edmet. Um, so there's some good kids on the way through, but they're just super young. What are your initial thoughts on Dave Brini? Uh I actually really like him. I've chatted to him for 15 seconds, yeah. <laughs> and that's it. And I and I and I base the fact that I like him um, just on his general demeanour is is really good, and and you can see how respectful he is of um, of the game and and of Australian rugby. And and Australian rugby is different than New Zealand rugby. But there are just differences there which are hard to explain. Um, and the other thing I like, I, I'm a Good mate of Murray Mexted, and uh, Mex doesn't suffer fools. And if you're an idiot, Mex isn't going to put up with you. And, and Dave coached with him for 10 years, so I figure <laughs> I figure he's a pretty decent bloke. And Steve O'Donnell said to me in Japan, uh, we, we had a couple of drinks and we had a couple of functions together, and Steve O'Donnell said he's, he's, Rennie's probably the best coach he's ever had. So I'm taking it on good Kiwi <laughs> experience that, it, that he's a good guy, but there's nothing that I've seen from him that I would say this guy's a lunatic. We're very likeable within 15 seconds, Kiwis, <laughs> though, mate. <laughs> Once we go outside that 15 second barrier, the jury's out. <laughs> but Marshy, he is a good bloke. I mean, you, yeah. you'd, you'd met him a few times. Yeah, I have, and, and I spent um, a bit of time with him uh, at um, Mex's Academy in Palmerston North, actually, and, and he was coaching there, and he was around some very good and, and worldly coaches at the time. I think Eddie was there, Wayne Smith was there, um, Grant Fox, some great guys that are, are excellent minds of the game. And, and Renz was quite a young coach at that time, but man, he was not out of place at that stage. And we're talking, what, sort of 15 years ago. And mm -hmm. um, at that time, I thought to myself, this guy, when he speaks, he has a really good mind for the game, but he has also, I think the key thing for a good coach is delivery. Like you can get a guy up there that's an absolute genius on the game but cannot deliver the message to the players, yeah. and they're sitting there going, what the hell did he just say? Yeah. <laughs> but but Renz has got this ability to get his message across and get the players to respond and act on it. And um, I thought, I remember at that time, this guy's going to be a very good coach. And uh, he's a big game for Australian rugby, a massive loss for us in New Zealand, I think. Well, I think the other thing that's good, f good for us right at the moment is you guys have a much deeper history of having Polynesian guys coming through your your teams at, at sort of super rugby level, all levels really, yeah. but super rugby and test level in particular, and, and you've handled that incredibly well. Um, 
we're much newer in that process. And I think Dave, um, being a Cook Islander himself and having that deep history of having the Polynesian boys coming through, I think that's going to be important for us to how we how we handle that because you know almost 50% of our team are, are Polynesians now. It's actually a good time to ask you about the the structure of Australian rugby. Um, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but there always seems to be uh, just a, str a strata missing. You know, I mean, you, you club rugby, but not a very strong provincial championship. Then you've got super rugby and then you've got international rugby. Is that kind of being addressed? Uh, well, our, our provinces, our provincial rugby is our state rugby because, you know, you've got 33 provinces or something, yeah, think something 20, like 27, 27 20, provinces yeah. or something, yeah. whatever it is. Um, we have seven states in the country and really two of them are the, the main New South Wales and Queensland are your main rugby states. Um, you know, 85, 90% of our players in this country come from those two states. But we've got a couple of manufactured teams in, in Victoria. Well, the Brumbies to a degree. The Brumbies do have a good club comp down there, but it's a very small state. There's only you know, a million people in the ACT. Um, and then you go to Western Australia and, and Victoria, which are really AFL states. So they're sort of more manufactured teams down there, which is um, uh, a difficult transition for us. So we've spread our player base a lot wider. Um, our club rugby, particularly in Sydney and Queensland, is still strong. Um, but again, we're at, a, at a super rugby level, we've spread that talent quite thin. And so we have to lift our skill base of a lot of those players, which you've done superbly. I mean, yeah. the skill level is amazing and we haven't quite got there yet. We're very lucky. Aren't we? I mean, the Mitre 10 Cup, which is sort of still currently going, Marsh, I mean, yep. that is just so strong, isn't it? Yeah, and, and we've always had that advantage over Australia. You know, population-wise, you've got more people, so it's perceived, well, you should have equally the, the same amount of players and talent. But obviously we don't have the, the competition in New, Ze in New Zealand that you do with, with the ARL and the NRL, you know, those... those yeah, yeah, but th those those sports are, are massive, aren't they? And and so rugby being our biggest game, we've got you know a huge amount of player depth and and sustainability in that. You know, we we, we can cope with losing players overseas, um, and 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 obviously Australia's had to readjust, haven't they, by saying right, well we we can't cope. It really drains our depth. So is it 50 or 70 tests? If you've played that, you yeah, can you certainly. can yes. Whereas New Zealand, you know, if you leave. That's it. You can't ever be an All Black, but yeah. we can afford to do that. That's probably a luxury Australia doesn't have. So, yeah, I think we're pretty grateful for the depth that we have. Well, I think the other advantage you've got is the size of your country. You know, the cost of travel between Perth and and Sydney yeah. is is expensive, which isn't as much between Auckland and Palmerston North. <laughs> <laughs> so, Phil, just staying with that subject, what can New Zealand rugby do to help Australian rugby? That's a really good question. We, we um, together, we are much more powerful uh, in terms of the world rugby stage and making changes in the game and development of the game. In terms of our financial um, clout that we can carry together, we're much stronger. I mean, we've seen um, private equity money come in into the Northern Hemisphere, which, which is, you know, jury's still out and how that's going to work. And I think it's good for us to be a close second be behind that to see if that works yeah. or not. Um, but together we, we create a much better competition and a much better product, and I hate using that word product in terms of rugby, but it is a TV product. Um, together we need to work together pretty closely on that. You know, of, of late there's been some fraught relationships <laughs> and I think people would um, probably go back and make some different decisions now um, than they made back then and make some different comments now. There's, there's no doubt that um, rugby administration in our country has been poor for quite a while and I think the new change that's happened at the top for us is, uh, is really good for our game and uh, it might take us three to five years to get back on track. Financially, we're a basket case. I mean, we're not the only union in the world that's a basket case because of COVID, but we're heading in that direction anyway. We've got a bloke called Andrew Forrest, um, who's got plenty, as they say. Can he be used? He, he can be, and uh, in the right way, under the right circumstances. And uh, <laughs> in, a, in a subtle way, you're saying controlled? Uh, no, 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 he doesn't want control. 
Right. He he certainly happy to have input, but he doesn't want control. Um, but you know the the governance of our game is quite different to in New Zealand. You you, you have a centralised approach and what happens at New Zealand Rugby Union really filters down beautifully We're all the way down through to the clubs um, from, you know, financially but also in the way you coach and the way you bring players through. Um, you know, if, if Rugby Australia says we want something done this way, then the states can go, get stuffed, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and so until we get that situation solved uh, it makes it far more difficult for people like an Andrew Forrest to um, to cast over, you know, to, to give money at Rugby Australia, and you wouldn't want to give that money unless Rugby Australia has a greater say in how um, that development's going to take place. Marshy, let's talk about the All Blacks. Um, big talking point over the last 12 months. Bowden Barrett, Richie Moonga, are they? Is it working? Etc. Etc. I think that argument's almost dead now. <laughs> Jabbing it through as Bowden Barrett leading the charge. Moonga, can he link up? No, he might have to go all the way himself. He's going to do it. Richie Moonga. Some razzle-dazzle from deep from the All Blacks. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's starting to resolve itself, isn't it? Look, when you've got two quality players that, um, you know, it's really hard to decide which one's going to start and are you going to inject one off the bench or are you going to, you know, try and micromanage the team around these two players to get them both on the field at the same time. Well, they've achieved that. Uh, and that meant an adjustment for Bowden Barrett, which I think it took him a little bit of time um, to, to be able to think about, you know, his position um, change because the dynamic is completely changing when you're at fullback with the space and, and the vision that you've got back there. So, look, I, th I certainly think that, um, you know, in that test match in Sydney, the third test, that, uh, you know, there's, there's no doubt that when he stepped into first receiver, put the chip over the top, and Moanga was there as as the sort of the receiver of that, that was that working really well. And I think Barrett started to adjust a lot better to fullback. So, yeah, it's certainly working. Um, and, and again, we're making compromises across the park, aren't we? Really, mm. because mm. you've got Geordie mm. Barrett playing on the wing, and he's a fullback. But um, you know, and again, in that Test match, and the really important one, he was outstanding, and and um, and, and is looking more and more uh, like a right winger. So. Yeah, I think the selections they're making are, are actually bearing fruit. Hey, it's um, we're very demanding as a rugby public, um, no matter where you are in the world, and and something changes and you just expect it to click like that. Yeah. Well, this experiment with these guys, it's taken what six to twelve months to come to fruition, and it started to work. You know, so it's same for us to expect Lolosio and Simone and and Pasami and Pattaya, expect them to just come in and click and be world class internationals in one or two tests. Forget it, it ain't gonna happen. We you really need time to develop as a team. Ian Foster, obviously under a bit of pressure. Not everybody thought he should be the All Black coach, Marshy. Um, it was kind of divided. Can you see his stamp already? Is it a different team to the one that Steve Hansen ran? Yeah, I can see the dynamics starting to, to piece together quite nicely. Um, I was really impressed with... So you've got it when you've got a coaching group, you've got to get that synergy, and no doubt Steve Hansen had that, uh, and it worked really well. He, he was obviously overseeing it all, and then he had Foster underneath him, and he had all the various parts working. Now, Foster has kept Scott McLeod, and I thought defensively the All Blacks in the first two tests were bloody good mm. because Australia <laughs> threw the kitchen sink at them. And many teams would have folded under that pressure with that amount of ball and territory. So defensively, I think they were very good, which means Scott McLeod's doing his job. So he's fitting into the dynamic. Um, Brad Moore's come in as, as an attacking coach. And so obviously him and Foster not knowing each other is going to take a little bit of time. So they've actually started to gel, and I think you started to see the shape and the attack much better and, and the understanding of the way that they want to play between sort of Aaron Smith and Richie Moonga. Um, as the general's starting to, to um, be realised. And, and that took time. You didn't see that in the first two tests. They look a bit disjointed. A couple of times I thought they, their decision-making wasn't great. So, yeah, I certainly think that... Look, when he's involved with the All Blacks and the success that they've had under Hanson, he's been to World Cups and he's won. Um, he's got new players in there, which was going to take a little time for him to mould. But he does know the way that the game is played. He does know that the All Blacks have to continue to get better. So... I think it's taken him a few test matches to find his feet, but I don't think they're there yet. You know, that uh, test match in Sydney, I certainly thought that they um, wouldn't be happy at their second half performance. He'd be pretty pissed off because they, they, they let the, that half slip become error-ridden error and, and, and got dragged into 
um, a contest that they were dominating in the first half. So uh, there's still work to be done, but the signs are really good. And one of the reasons that happens is because a lot of guys come off the bench yep. and it becomes disjointed. You blokes largely, well, maybe, yeah, you blokes largely played in an era where you played 80 minutes. And the only reason you didn't was you got injured or... Your leg had come off. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so what do you reckon about all the, you know, running guys on after 60 because it's written on the script? I hate it. <laughs> I absolutely hate it. I think if, you, if you're going to go and have replacements, then maybe you say, OK, at 20 minutes, 40 minutes and 60 minutes, that's when you can do replacements. Forget about anything else. But in my view, you play 80 and, you know... That's when the game opens up. That's when you need to be... Your fitness comes to the fore. I mean, uh, you know, I hate the whole replacement thing. I, I really do. And uh, I, I don't think it's added too much to the game, to be frank. I, I, you know, we've seen a few more players come in through the system, but I don't think it adds a lot. What about the league system where you can run on and off and get a couple of stints on the field? Would that be a better way to do it? Or no, no, I hate that too. No, no, no. no, I think... You know, there's some things in our game that we tinker with too much. Ours is a different game to rugby league and it's a different game to AFL and it's a different game to soccer. We, we've got things about our game that sometimes we get carried away and we see something over there, we say, oh, we like that new little shiny thing, we want some of that. And <laughs> we, we, we don't need that, we shouldn't, shouldn't be having that. You know, the beauty of our game, our, our game is built on respect. That's, that's where it started. There's a position on the field for a fat bloke, for a tall bloke, for a skinny bloke, for a fast bloke, for whatever, there's a position for everyone. And stick to it, oh, that's, you know, you know, you have a fat bloke and he gets tied towards the end of the game and that creates opportunities and sometimes the fat bloke can do something good too. And so let, let's keep some of the traditional parts of our game that may have made our game. I think the balance is out of kilter. I think what, what happens is, in a, in a tough test match, that, that is being fought, and, and the, the, the result is definitely you know, up for debate within the last 20 minutes, the last quarter of the game. Substitutes come on, and they have to adjust to the tempo. They have to get in there, and they have to make a difference and an impact. So the game's continuity continues because of the scoreline and, and, I guess, the energy of the game. But then you get a, a game on a different dynamic where one team's dominating and, and clearly going to win the game, and all of a sudden the coaches just go, right, yeah. Old mate hasn't had a run for a while and substitutes just come on and basically there's no real rhythm in the game because it's, it's lost the contest. Yeah, yeah I agree. And, and it becomes and an opportunity someone, to give players a run. What about they bring someone on with a minute to go? It's like, hang oh on. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but you haven't been through me. I refuse to go on one time in, <laughs> in France. I got stood down for two weeks because I said, I'm not going on. It's 30 seconds to go. It's minus two. Mind you, you did walk off one day too. Yeah, I did do that too, yeah. <laughs> this is not about me, this boat. <laughs> All right, boys, thanks very much for joining us. And, uh, Phil, let's hope things are a little bit better at Suncorp. Yeah, well, Suncorp has um, been a pretty good hunting ground for us. But, you know, it's irrelevant now. It's too late. You know, we needed to be in that, uh, in that game, the third one. And, uh, oh, well. Say the Bring it on. Say it's great to have you here. And sorry about the rain. Thanks, boys. Thanks, mate. Oh yeah, that's our first edition of uh, Playmakers. So join us next week and uh, with another edition as we uh, continue our tour here through Australia.